Hour number one, rolling along right here on the early line on a Wednesday morning edition. Donnie Wright side along with Davis Maddock. We're going to talk some NBA hoops here because teams are going home. Teams are trying to advance. It is going to be a crazy run to an NBA championship. And it started yesterday with a doubleheader. We're going to get to the second game here of that doubleheader first. And that was the Sacramento Kings 118 Golden State Warriors 94. When we were doing the show yesterday, myself and Ben here, Davis, it was a minus two point spread. I said to myself, I trust the rings over the Kings in this game, which means, yes, Sacramento is talented. Yes, they are at home. It's going to be a great atmosphere, but I figured the Golden State Warriors just built for this atmosphere more than the Sacramento Kings. The veteran leadership, they're going to steady the pace. The heart rate won't get too high because they're used to these type of scenarios, only to find out that the Kings absolutely pounded the Golden State Warriors. So let's start there. What was the expectations for you, Davis? For me, I thought this was a Warriors game. Maybe if they lost, it would be close. They got absolutely hammered yesterday by the Kings. I mean, I really thought this was your classic, you know, battle-tested playoff veterans, Curry, Clay, Draymond. They've all been there, done that. You know, Looney starting center on a, on a mm-hmm. championship team. Now, they do have a lot of young guys in there, uh, you know, Pajemski and, uh, and Moody and uh and, and Kaminga those guys really weren't the problem if you if you watch the game if you look at the box score the young guys actually all pretty much did their job I mean it's just very hard to to see what's happened to Clay Thompson I guess for from someone who has been you know uh, witness to so many great moments from him but he really I mean he's a losing NBA player right now he he is not nearly as strong on the defensive end as he used to be you uh, pretty much was was I actually think at their absolute peaks Clay was an even crazier warper of defenses because he didn't need to dribble. He didn't need to look at the basket. He would come off that elevator, pin down, and it was just like an automatic three points. There was nothing you could do. And when Clay's out there playing 31 minutes and can't hit the broadside of a barn, well, you're basically playing three on five on offense because the Warriors are always playing a non shooter right now, whether it be Trace Jackson Davis, Kevon Looney, or Draymond Green. And it just basically meant that Steph Curry had no room to breathe they were trapping him they were doubling him and I I I suppose if you had told me that Clay was going to have one of his worst games of the season I would have been all over the Kings I just didn't really think that was particularly likely yeah 94 points out of the Warriors and you're right about this the handicap scenario for me yesterday was again just trusting the Warriors even though it was a heavy public favorite so you know what let me remove that for the conversation here let's just see how these two teams are going to match up and then when you take a look at some of those prop bets right you're looking at Draymond Green possibly scores 12 points in that game okay Steph Curry only gets 22, but I was with you. It was one of those where I was really focusing on Klay Thompson, not because we thought he would dominate and he's the best player on the team, but your main focus is always Steph Curry, which means you're going to get left open for some wide open shots. It's just up to you to knock those down. 32 minutes for Klay Thompson, basically just doing cardio out there last night. 0 for 10 from the field, 0 for 6 from three-point range, doesn't get to the free throw line, finishes with zero points here. And then we take a look at that experiment here that started at the beginning of the season, Davis. Hey, how's Chris Paul? going to fit into this team well he plays 18 minutes in a playoff game minus 15 and comes away with three points just on one three-point shot made it was a bad effort all the way around for the Golden State Warriors but also if we take a look at the Sacramento Kings guys were stepping up Murray 11 of 25 from the floor which included 24 points but if you take a look at the starting lineup for the Sacramento Kings Sabonis plus 25 Barnes plus 29 Murray plus 20 Fox plus 20 Ellis plus 27 the starting lineup absolutely dominated last night for the Sacramento Kings. They did. I mean, I think the biggest surprise here has got to be the Keegan Murray absolute explosion. I, I suppose that en- what ended up happening was that they decided that Trace Jackson Davis couldn't play in this game. They stuck Kaminga in. They played a lot of three-guard lineups with Clay, Curry, Pajemski, or, or subbing in Chris Paul in those lineups. I actually... The thing I found most surprising was the limited minutes for Paul. I thought this was a pretty good spot for him because, you know, Keon Ellis played 39 minutes. He only took eight shots in this game. I mean, how many dribbles went along with those eight shots? Like, Keon Ellis was not a guy that you had to limit at the point of attack. So I thought that that basically provided a spot on defense for the 38-year-old Chris Paul. Like, not that he's a bad defensive player, but he's 38 years old. He just is probably not going to be able to play A-level defense for 30 minutes in a playoff game. If I was Steve Kerr, my my plan for this game would have been I, I maybe even would have started Chris Paul and, and Steph Curry together in the backcourt just to give me some more ball handling and to give me some calm and some composure. Because something that's been a problem for the Warriors as long as this iteration of the team has existed 
has been the turnovers. I mean, even when they were, uh, you know, winning 73 games, when they were going through the playoffs undefeated, they really struggled with the turnovers. Curry turned the ball over three times in this game. Draymond turned the ball over three times. They had 16 turnovers as a team compared to only eight turnovers for the Kings. And I mean, that's pretty much the story of the game was everyone on the Kings did their job. Keegan Murray, I mean, Keegan Murray was awesome in this game. He took 13 three-pointers, 13 three-pointers from your power forward in a playoff game. He made eight of them. There was just nothing. I, I suppose Draymond just was not comfortable going all the way out on the perimeter against Keegan Murray. And it just, I mean, it absolutely murdered them. It's it's wild to take a look at because a team that's used to making more three-point shots than the other team is the Golden State Warriors. 31% from three-point range, the Warriors were 10 of 32. You flip it over to the Kings. Now, we always know you typically shoot better at home. 46% from three-point range, 18 of 39. And just looking at the starting lineup, Barnes made three of four. Murray, eight of 13. Fox was two for eight. And then Ellis was three of four. But keep in mind, too, this wasn't one of those boat races at the beginning of the game. It was a nine-point game at the end of the first quarter. But the Golden State Warriors actually won the second quarter by five points. So we're looking at a close game at the half coming out of it. 37 points on the home court for the Kings, followed by 27. Just not enough in the tank for the Golden State Warriors. And this is what happens when you have a one-game playoff. Winner moves on, loser goes home. If you don't bring your A game, which certainly the Warriors didn't, they got knocked out quickly here and the Kings will move on. So let's take a look at what the Golden State Warriors have done over the past couple years. 2020, missed the playoffs. 2021, lost in the play-in tournament. 2022, NBA champions. 2023, lost in round number two. And 2024, lost in the play-in tournament. The future of the Golden State Warriors is what for you right now, Davis? I mean, they have some tough questions to ask of themselves. They have the most expensive roster in NBA history. <laughs> they have multiple of their, you know, great players whose contracts are going to be, um, you know, they're, they're going to be done soon. Uh, Clay Thompson's contract expires. They have Chris Paul, who is non-guaranteed for next year, which means that they can get rid of him. So they can shave, you know, that's that's about $80 million off of their books right there. They're also going to have to make a decision on Draymond Green, who uh, they did sign to a contract extension. But I actually think he's on a cap number that they could move if they attached a draft pick. He makes $24 million. And they have the bones, you know, so you go with Curry, you go with Kaminga, you go with Moses Moody, you go with Pajemski, and that's kind of your starting lineup for next season. I don't think there's a, any chance that's actually what they do. I, I think they end up probably retaining Clay Thompson on a relatively team-friendly contract, particularly after how bad he was in this game. Like, if you just look out in the market, who's given Clay Thompson $37 million a year? You know, are the Pistons going to do it? or the You know who actually – he actually, even in this state of being, would actually be a great Orlando Magic player because they have the defense – to absorb his shortcomings on that end. And they just like, the Magic are just begging for some air on offense. It's sad to see that this is going to kind of be the end of Curry's career. You know, it's it's definitely, this is not the 98 Bulls, right? They just are not good. Because the Western Conference also is just so good. I mean, like the Oklahoma City Thunder kind of coming out of nowhere to be the one seed. I, I would imagine that probably was not in their projections as an organization that they would have to deal with that. The Timberwolves with their twin towers, you know, that's all working out. I think the future is probably we see the same exact guys run it back next year. They're, again, the most expensive team in the NBA. They probably win 47 games. Is 47 games going to be no – Chris Paul won't be back. They, they're, they're not going to renew his contract. So it will be more Pajemski uh, and more Moses Moody next year. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy the way it's going to work out because at the beginning of the season, we do a pick six on some of the futures wagers. My team total under was the Golden State Warriors, and they barely stayed under that. But a lot more question marks on the future because the one thing we do know is they have a good ownership group out there. They'll pay into the luxury tax, but they want to return on that investment, which means, hey, at least get us a couple home playoff games which the Warriors weren't able to provide. A mile-high win by the Lakers. Let's review that next right here on the Sports Grid Network. Right back out of here on the early line Wednesday morning edition, Sirius XM Channel 159 Sports Grid Network. Davis and Donnie here having some fun talking NBA action. And game number one of the doubleheader last night took place in New Orleans. That was the Los Angeles Lakers, depending on where you're shopping at yesterday. Minus ones on your side, plus ones on your side, going back and forth all day. The Lakers, obviously a heavy public favorite in the betting markets, and they won the game. 
110 to 106. Strong first quarter by New Orleans, 34 to 26 over the Lakers. But the Lakers quickly flipped that script, Davis, in the second quarter by winning that 34 to 16. And away the Lakers went. It got really close into the late fourth quarter stages here. But the Lakers were able to hold on and punch their ticket as the seventh seed. And the New Orleans Pelicans now looking to play another game at home maybe without a superstar player, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. Talk to us about the game last night, your feelings heading into the Lakers-Pelicans. For me, I thought the Lakers would be able to win this one, similar to what I thought about the Golden State Warriors, but the Lakers were able to handle their business. Yeah, I mean, look, I I felt pretty much the same way. The Lakers dominated the Pelicans in the regular season, and there's some pretty clear reasons why. The Pelicans, I, I don't know what their coaching staff is doing with Jonas Valanciunas, but they just... They refuse to play him. And and, I mean, I think in general, going away from a big, you know, ground bound center like Valentunas makes sense in a lot of matchups. And the the perfect lineup for the Pelicans over the long term would be for Zion to be good enough defensively to play at center. You know, if, if we had prime athletic Duke Zion Williamson. Yeah, you, you'd play that lineup. The issue has been that Zion has had to stay a power forward in the NBA because he just is not good enough defensively as a center. He can't protect the rim. He can't move laterally quick enough. He's still an incredible offensive player. We see that last night. He goes 40 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists. But, you know, he can't do the Giannis. He can't do the Draymond Green and anchor your defense and still be a productive offensive player. Maybe if he dedicated all of his energies in the offseason – to losing 15 pounds and becoming this incredible defensive player. The Pelicans could get to where they want to go. But as it stands right now, they always have to be playing one of Jonas Valanciunas or Larry Nance, which hurts them on offense, obviously, because you're playing a guy who can't shoot and and, and won't shoot and who teams won't respect as a shooter, which means the Lakers just absolutely punish them inside. LeBron was awesome in this game, uh, got to the free throw line, five different times. Anthony Davis just, I mean, in the non-Valentunas minutes, they can't rebound at all. So, of course, Anthony Davis ends up with 15 rebounds. And you got to hand it to him. I mean, the the, the oft-maligned D'Angelo Russell, 7 for 14 from Mm. the floor, only one turnover, six assists. He was a team high, plus 16 in this game. Everyone loves to laugh at D'Angelo Russell. He's had such a weird career. You know, the the whole incident with Nick Young, he gets traded. He's part of the, the Kevin Durant trade for the goal like he's just had a very bizarre career but they definitely I will say this 0.0 percent chance can the Lakers win a playoff series without D'Angelo Russell playing near the top of his game because he is their best ball handler other than LeBron and he was really good early in that game, too. A couple of clutch three-point shots to sort of get the Lakers back into the game with some momentum. You saw him drawn with the crowd, really engaged into that environment. And he ends up with 21 points overall. So let's focus on the Los Angeles Lakers and that starting lineup. They got balance all the way across. Davis with 20 points. Uh, Rui Hachimura, 13 points. LeBron James, 23. You see D'Angelo Russell with 21. And Austin Reeves with 16 points. So many times you win the three-point line, you win the basketball game. And the Lakers went 14 of 35 from three-point range, four 40% will take that as a team because, quite frankly, only 41% as a team from the floor if we combine two points and also three-point shooting. Now I'm going to beef with LeBron James, who was very good last night. 23 points, nine rebounds, going along with nine assists. Almost a triple-double in a road playoff game. That's pretty impressive. But I liked him, Davis, over 43 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. So I always like to do this post-game. If you would have told me, Davis, he's going to get nine rebounds, nine assists, go to the free throw line 10 times, make all 10 free throws, and then you tell me he's going to have 20 shot attempts from the floor. How does he not cross over that? Well, he didn't last night because he was 6 of 20 from the field. But the Lakers do advance. Very good analysis here. You get some time to rest up for that that Denver series. But before we get there, let's focus on the Pelicans here and what happened with their game yesterday. Was it so simple, Davis, that you look at Zion Williamson, who was absolutely filthy in this game, 17 of 27, 40 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists, gets injured in this game, which is so like Zion. If Zion plays the full game here, do the Pelicans win this one? We'll never know. But what was your feeling on that? I mean, I think I think probably not because the I mean the thing is Zion has nowhere to go on defense against the Lakers. He is not 
it feels crazy to say, but 39-year-old LeBron James, the literal oldest player in the NBA, is too strong for him. Like, LeBron will try and put Zion in the action. He'll get the ball, and he will, you know, he'll, he'll motion to whoever he needs to to get Zion in the action. And if you have Nance in there, then you, have no, you don't really have rim protection, right? So then it ends up being a pick and roll with Anthony Davis. If you have Jonas Valanciunas in there, I mean, look, if you, if you want Joe Val meeting LeBron at the rim, you, you pretty much, it's, it's going to be a foul or it's going to be a bucket. So I, I, I mean, the, the best defensive lineup that the Lakers have does not include Zion Williamson. And um, I, I do want to give a shout out to Herb Jones, who like, that guy left it all on the floor. He was ball denying LeBron James, you know, from full court, you know, 90, 96 feet from the time that the whistle blew. Can you imagine how exhausting and how intimidating that's got to be? Like, was Herb Jones even born when LeBron James got drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers? Like, he literally might not, like, he literally may not have been. Um, I, I think Herb, and Herb, by the way, um, I mean, he shot, he shot, I believe, 39% from three-point range this year. The The Pelicans' future is so bright as a team if Zion can get in, like, the absolute peak physical shape, right? If Zion becomes a B plus defensive player, a guy who you can play at center 15 minutes a night, I mean, I would say the Pelicans have just as high of a ceiling as the Oklahoma City Thunder, as the Minnesota Timberwolves, because they this these guys are so good. Now I, I do think they probably will have to move on from CJ McCollum. Like it's just very hard to have an above average defense when you have like what maybe is, is cj mccall the smallest player in the nba he might he might actually be but i don't think zion staying i mean zion played 36 minutes like if he goes to 40 minutes do they win this game i don't think so and that because that's the other thing is you got to bet against lebron at the end of a game and I, i'll never do that i mean lebron is Le, i i am not old enough to have watched michael jordan play nba games so lebron is the best basketball player i've ever seen in my life you hit a clutch jumper late in that game, too, with a man in his face, which shows you, like, he's there. And certainly, you want to be able to hold on with LeBron James at the end. But quite frankly, you look at Zion, 40 points in that game. He was absolutely tremendous. Got absolutely no help, Davis, from that starting lineup here. Ingram, 11 points. Jones, 10 points. Valanciunas, 4 points. McCollum, 9 points. And also, I always like to play that box score game. Tell me before the game that Zion's going to drop 40, and you're going to have three guys come off the bench for the Pelicans to score double digits. Nance Jr., 10 points. Alvarado, 10 points. Trey Murray. 12 points here that should have been good enough for a victory here now as we look forward there are news and notes coming out of this game where yes zion was an absolute beast but quite frankly i don't think we see zion again in this playoff run which could only mean one more game here as they line up against the sacramento kings the reports coming out that it's a hamstring injury for an explosive player that's not something you could shake off here so talk to me davis about the new orleans pelicans now probably not playing with Zion in the next round of the play-in tournament here, the play-in round. What's going to happen with the Pelicans? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty bad spot for them against the Kings, who can score 120 against anyone. The, the, the one thing I would say, Matt Moore um, from the Action Network tweeted this, which is like, you just absolutely have to play Trey Murphy in these games. It can't be. It can't. There, there, there can't be any politics. You can't be worried about hurting Brandon Ingram's feelings. You can't be worried about hurting CJ McCollum's feelings. Trey Murphy is the second best offensive player on the New Orleans Pelicans. He played 31 minutes in this game. Uh, I think the the. I actually think the adjustment you make against the Kings is. Um, I guess if you don't have Zion, you start Jonas Valanciunas and Larry Nance together. I I would consider bringing Brandon Ingram off the bench, I, there's no chance they do that, right? I mean, Brandon Ingram is is their highest paid player. He is their so there is their second franchise player after um after Zion Williamson. Like they they just won't do that. I definitely think they should. Uh I I mean they're not gonna win against the Kings without Zion. They're just they're drawing hundred percent completely stone dead. They don't have they don't have the horses. The Kings are the Kings are too good on offense. And I mean look, we literally just saw it. The Keon Ellis factor is insane. I mean, Keon Ellis is basically as good of a defender as Herb Jones is. He's a little bit smaller, so you can't you can't stick him out on a six eight wing and get the same results. But in, in a, a very blessing in this guy's way, losing Monk and Herder for the Kings totally backdoored them in. And this guy who was like not even in their rotation, like winning them a road play in game or winning them a, a home play in game. Quick preview here, Friday night, 9.30 p.m., Kings and the Pelicans. The Pelicans will be the home team here. Overnight line was a minus 2.5. That's now dropped at the FanDuel Sportsbook to a minus 1.5. And, and if anybody knows, 
anything about hamstring injuries, the fact that Zion did not return to that game last night, he is not going to play Friday night. You can bookmark that right now at this point. So looking at that game Friday night, is it? it's still a home game here for the Pelicans. They'll still be energized, but that's got to be demoralizing. So looking at that number, minus one and a half and a total of 218, your thoughts, Davis, would be, you know what? It's Sacramento or nobody here. Yeah, I mean, I just, like, there's no one on the Pelicans roster who I think can get in the way of what the Kings like to do on offense, which is you give the ball to DeMontis Sabonis on on the elbow, dribble handoffs. Like, Sabonis is is such an underrated player because he's so bad on defense and he's a big man. I mean, it's it's not dissimilar from what uh, we used to say about Nikola Jokic, you know, five, six years ago. It's like, sure, it's great. He could do all this stuff and he's so fun, but he's just a turnstile on the other end. Jokic got better on defense. Sabonis never has. But who's punishing him here? What is Larry? Is Larry Nance going to put Do- Domas in the basket? I, I don't think so. How about that? The NBA playoffs underway. Another doubleheader tonight, which we'll get to a little bit later in the show. Sixers, Heat, Hawks, and Bulls. But it's time to get on the diamond and recap what happened last night right here on the early line. 